for the little bit that kind of uh, patient. How many of you have been to patient with it before? Okay, so quite a few. <laughs> Uh, some veterans also. So Pechakucha is uh, a format which is 20 images into 20 seconds each. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, there's a theme and you as a speaker you have a story to tell. You choose 20 images and each image runs for only 20 seconds and it automatically moves to the next one. So you don't, as a speaker you don't have a control over it. You just decide your story and then it runs on its own so that it keeps moving forward. Pecha Kucha started in, uh, in Tokyo in 2003 and now it's uh, over uh, 1300 cities across the world. So it's kind of, it's quite big now. It's a very uh, casual evening. So it's, a, it's an evening where you can have a beer, you can have a drink, you know, you can come in your short and, uh, you know, uh, be in the podium and tell a story or share an idea. So that's the kind of concept uh, Pecha Kucha is. So I've been running Pacha Kucha for some time now. I used to run it at, when I was in New Zealand and in Australia. So when I moved to Goa a few years ago, I thought Goa is such a creative space, uh, you know, and there's so many creative people, interesting people. We should have Pacha Kucha here. So I started Pacha Kucha in October 2018. So we've completed three years and this is our 27th edition. So we've come a long way and we built it quite a nice community. So there are a lot of interesting people who want to tell their stories. So before uh, at Pecha Kucha, everything is pretty quick, fast, uh, no fooling around. We start and finish pretty quickly because this presentation is only 6 minutes 40 seconds. So I'll take you through the order of the day. Uh, some housekeeping, uh, uh, the two bathrooms, ladies bathroom is on the left, the men's bathroom is on the right. Okay, uh, there is food counter, Satya is doing the food counter over there. Hi Satya! <laughs> and there's beer counter, there's two, uh, there's Penny and uh, uh, there's gin counter uh, uh, outside. So if you feel thirsty, please help yourself. Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, so that's uh, pretty much it is. Uh, we have a break after five presentation. We do something very interesting in the break because we just want the crowd to be engaged. So we have something called Badas Bop. So Badas Bop is about just taking your Badas out. We'll give you 30 seconds to come on the stage and just say anything you like, okay? So Satya is the one who's, who coordinates Badas Bop. So you have to give your name. Okay, you can tell a story, sing a song, or you can, uh, you know, you can promote your business. Whatever you want, you get 30 seconds. Just give your name to Satya uh, during the break and uh, we'll invite you. It's not a fun, okay? Nobody's here to judge anyone, so just be yourself. So that's going to happen in the break after five, fifth presentation. And then in the end, we have a, a group photo, which is a lot of fun also. So something like this. So please stay back for the photo, but usually people just want to rush out because they want to move their car. So just stay back for a little while and we'll have a group photo. So uh, these are our uh, social media handles, Pecha Kucha Goa, Instagram and, uh, and uh, uh, we've got on Facebook. So if you like us, if you like what you see, if you want to take part in Pecha Kucha in future, please like us so you can communicate with us. And you know what, what we're doing, what is coming up next. Okay, so before I start, I want to just say thank you to a few very important uh, people here because of them we come so far. So we have our gym partner, uh, Greater Than. Uh, I just want to say hi to them, but I think they're outside, they can't hear me. Tanvay, can you hear me? Oh, he can't. So we've got Makadi. Is anybody from Makadi? Beer? So Makadi has been us uh, for, and Anike is the, Ek is the, the Fenny sponsor. Then we got food by Simply Sardo. Satya, hello. <laughs> she makes some lovely, lovely food. Okay, and Swami is our uh, uh, mixing partner. And uh, I want to thank Dean also for this space. It's such a beautiful uh, space. So just, just give uh, Dean a big hand. Thank you, Dean. So this is, I mean, if you're doing heritage uh, talk, I think this 
this is the, the perfect venue. How old is the place, Dean? Oh, wow, that's great. Yeah, so it's still going strong and it's, it's beautiful. So thank you for that. And uh, this night is all about speakers. So I'm going to get off the mic and let the speakers uh, take over. So just give a big hand to the speakers in advance, please. So it's, it's, it's going to be a fun night. So we have a couple of dropouts. One is very sick and one uh, uh, just couldn't make it. But we still have a good number and very, very interesting speakers. All right. So FC Goa is our title sponsor. So I'm not sure if anybody from FC Goa is here. Uh, they've been very generous with uh, supporting us in so many ways. All right, so moving on to our first speaker. And first speaker is, is a challenge to be a first speaker. So give it up for Harold. 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 I think everybody knows you now, but I'll still do a small introduction. Come. So Varun Hegre was born and brought up in this picturesque Goan village of Binole, one of my favorite places. Huh? Having graduated with a degree in electronics and telecommunication engineering, he worked for four years with the prestigious Tata Consultancy Services. His last job was in Frankfurt, Germany, as on-site coordinator with multinational bank. Warren quit his company in India along with, uh, sorry, Warren got his job in 2017 and founded Soul Traveling, a leading offbeat experience-based travel company in India along with Kedar Borkar. Is Kedar here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Soul Traveling has been featured in leading magazines and National, National Geographic Traveler, uh, Conte Nas, Traveler, and Lonely Planet for its experiences. It was featured in Live Mint for curating one of the most unconventional trails in India. Varun will be talking about stories from Goa and how storytelling, storytelling can create an impact on people. So over to Varun. Give it up. Yes, is everyone ready? Okay, good evening everyone. Uh, it's great to be talking about Goa. I'm Jay Goy, my colleague Bhagra, Jay Goy. And today we'll be talking about a journey through the eyes of a 26 year old, uh, uh, 26 year old young person who came to Goa from Germany, who was bursting with confidence and just wanted to see what Goa has to offer. If you haven't guessed, that's me. And uh, that's how much I knew about Goa when I actually took this trip. Uh, but during this journey, I want a little bit of support from you. I'll be talking about a few concepts on what defines Goa. So if you like the concept, say yeah. And if you don't, if you don't think it defines Goa, say no. Okay, and before jumping right into the uh, stream and right into this uh, discussion, uh, just do it. Just when the next slide comes in, so that it's a cue for me also to change, uh, to speak on the next slide. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay, so you have to be ready from the next slide onwards, right? And firstly, I'll be talking about, the first topic is villages. Do villages define Goa? Yeah. After the end of the slide, please. So this village that we are standing in right now, Saligao. It comes, the name comes from either the Sal tree or Sal village, uh, Sal, uh, Chirasal rice as well. Even the other villages in Goa, which are named after, you know, crops. Uh, Asagao, for example, it's named after a crop, Asgo, as Victor will tell you, and not, not after the, the asses who, uh, you know, keep it as a status symbol to uh, consider this as a second home in Asagao. Okay, next, uh, festivals. I want all of you to be here on 11th of this month, where Chikal Kalo happens in a village called Marshall. Where you actually have your very own, uh, you know, pe uh, people, personalities in Goa. Do you know this guy? Yes. Honest for this, go to Tata Memo Memorial Hospital in Mumbai, and the road is named after this gentleman from Ukasan in Goa. A beautiful village. And <laughs> okay, monuments. Does monuments define Goa? Has anyone been here? Okay, I want you to know about a very interesting story of Queen Ketevan, whose bones were actually found at this tower here, and the city of Old Goa, which actually defines what, uh, you know, great, nature, islands, the Shorav Island, 
Goa. <laughs> okay, great. Goa, which has 0.1% of land area of India, actually has 37% of its birds that can be cited. The listed birds could be cited. So if you visit Chorao, it's definitely a place which you... <laughs> art. Does art define Goa? A village of Kunkolim uh, actually has this art called Ch uh, Chitari art uh, in a uh, place called Demani, which is practiced there for centuries and one of the only places where this art is practiced in Goa. There are many more arts like Kavi and all. I'm pretty sure Hita will cover that. Okay, history. The first capital of Goa, Chandrapur. But do you know of a story of this gentleman, a famous traveler from Ibn Batuta, who actually was a part of this attack on the city of Chandrapur or Chandor? Uh, there are many other stories like the curse of the queen. The food. I think Oliver is here and the food definitely defines what Goa is, the culinary expertise that Goa has is what uh, what makes up Goa, right? So you have different kinds of food that is, uh, you know, you can find it all over and I'm pretty sure that is one thing that will define Goa for sure. Music! If you go to Bollywood today, you'll realize that a lot of Goan, a lot of Bollywood is inspired from what Goans have given to Bollywood. You have legends like Anthony Gonsalves, Mikhail Martins and all the others who actually came up with different tunes, songs and made up what Bollywood music is today. <laughs> Events that happened in Goa. This is what you'll find in a village called, in a place called Margao, where if you look closely, the date says 21-9-1890, where a massacre happened in the city of Margao where 23, uh, 23 people were shot dead uh, during this event. So events define what Goa is all about, right? Okay, this story you should come to me after this. I'll explain you in detail. But this is a hero stone which is found in the fields of Pandora. You'll just walk along and you'll find this hero stone there. And this actually comes, uh, you know, the hero stones actually tell a story about warriors that are there in Goa. Okay, this everyone should know. Pansaymar, a village which has uh, petroglyphs or rock carvings which are found. Uh, these have been recently nominated as, you know, something uh, that could be uh, a World Heritage Site also soon. It's not yet, but it's been nominated as well uh, for that. So, okay, rituals, rituals and traditions. I think you can see a lot of familiar faces here, but rituals and traditions. You have the stories of uh, the betas from the Loliam village uh, in Kankon, which uh, actually symbolizes a lot of worship of the local deities and you know traditions that are followed in Goa. So, what finally defines Goa? I think one of the most important part is the smile that you get when you meet the people, when you actually feel uh, you know uh, feel at home. It's a place of belonging for everyone. And these are the stories that we were discussing. It was just like a 26 year old going to different villages, trying to get the stories. And what happened today is, it's been four years, and uh, I'm no more 26, I'm 30 now. But I have a team of 15, 16 people who are trying to create the stories and get it out to the world. We want to make sure people feel welcome to in Goa. They actually understand the stories and share it with the world. And they have fun while doing it. I've actually spoken for five minutes and not talked about beaches, parties, or anything else that you'll be expecting me to talk about in Goa, right? Because Goa is much more, it's like an uh, you know, untold secret, and it only reveals itself to people who would care to explore. And yes, so Soul Traveling is all about that. It's a company that we have uh, founded to tell the stories of different villages to people and uh, just to make sure they experience, explore and go home with a smile and feel like they belong to Goa. It's a part, they become a part of this beautiful place. Uh, so, uh, just a footnote, I'm not even covering architecture, fairy uh, houses because there are a lot of other speakers who will be covering that, museums. So, the whole thing is, this is just the beginning and there is not more to go up, uh, to come after this. Thank you so much. The right guy to tell the Goan story, right? Look at the passion. I think he deserves one more uh, round of clap for passion. Well done. All right, moving on. Okay, we got Ria.
I thought everybody is going to be late today, but everybody turned up at 6 o'clock and you were not even ready. So, good on you, Govan. Yeah. Good on you. And it's, uh, I think it's a good, a very good uh, crowd we got. I was expecting half one turn up, but you braved it and thank you for coming. We'll have a lot of fun. So, I will introduce Riga. Riga is an architect, art uh, conservator, and art educator based in Goa. The arts has always been an in, innate interest for her, for her first internship at the, new, the newly formed Goa Chitra, where she drew and measured artifacts, visited a Dandar settlement, and had the honor of observing the making of traditional earth house. She has explored mapping of Panjim city, its heritage houses, and natural features through her fellowship at the Charles Correa Foundation, and per pursued art uh, conservation under the London School of Picture and Frame Conservation, and has been carefully restoring various private artworks along with the practical work of conservation and architecture. So today she will be talking about her experience with the river and our community. Over to Riga. All right. Okay, so uh, Noi, the river draw, was uh, found in 2018. It was formed and it flows into themes of ecology, community, and participatory art. And we did this with an idea of trying to create some social awareness around our rivers. And um, yeah, doing it. So, um, Bookworm, uh, situated right in the heart of Mala. Uh, it was obvious for us to choose Mandovi as our river because we have the Ore Creek, we have the Mandovi right there. And uh, yeah, so uh, Bookworm being a library based organization and a charitable trust, we wanted to link uh, rivers with libraries. So we said, what way, better way that is to start at the source? So this is actually uh, my Ristika roots, okay, at the source of the river. And as Varun would have just hit upon sacred groves. This is part of our great uh, culture of rivers. And um, what we did is, because I'm an architect and this is what we do, we do naughty things, we mapped all the uh, libraries across the Mandavi and we had 14 sites that we went to. We'll come back to the slide because by the time you start noticing it, it'll change. And uh, we had 14 different sites and we had this process that we uh, did, which was a very participatory process, where we asked people to recollect their memories around the river, their knowledge around the river, and uh, their vision for their river. So these drawings that you see are based solely on these and a few theatrical tricks. So uh, besides, besides also just having this large piece of paper put out for the people to draw onto, uh, we had uh, the, uh, games where we would ask people to say a word in Konkani that reminded them of their river and in the dialect uh, that they chose. So we had different age groups. There were little ones, there were older ones, and everybody drew. And if they couldn't draw, they were instructing the, the younger people what to draw about their river. So, uh, yeah, we had, we approached schools, we approached libraries, and uh, the same river, a calmer area close to the embankments and something up north where the water speed goes up to almost maybe 40 kilometers. So two, two sides of our same river, the Mahadai Mandavi as we know it. Uh, and yeah, this is one of the results of the site in Kandipur where we had this six meter long uh, panel that the community drew themselves based on their memories, knowledge and vision for their river. And uh, along, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you through these uh, slides where we zoom in and we look at each drawing. So this is at the, uh, one of the sources, uh, tributaries of the Mandavi. This is at the Dudh Sagar. 
So if you see up there, there is a little bit of a railway sort of a crossing. All of you must be familiar with Mole and the sanctuary. And um, so this was one uh, part of that. Across the rivers, when we zoomed in, we also saw these sort of embankments that were built. And these were, we saw a lot of these in the, in the Satari Taruka when we did our draws there. So you'd see a very um, subconscious of, of the surroundings coming through through these drawings. Um, right, this is in Savoy Vere. And this drawing is a clipping from a Volvoy, which is a cross. And if you know Goa and you know the river, you know that this area used to be heavily into mining. And even though the river looks pristine, you still see a little bit of a red truck going through. So it's still in their memory, uh, uh, going through these areas. Uh, this is a very cute one. This is uh, done by the children in old Goa. And that over there is the island of Diva that's represented. So you see the embankments, you see the mangroves, you see the buns coming through. And I don't think I've ever seen a map of Divar as creatively put as this. Oh. And also coming, because I'm talking about old Goa, if you look at the first slide, you'd see the river coming through, through uh, the manual line architecture. So you see the ropes around the arches. You see Kavi Art, which Heta will tell you about more coming from the earth, the very soil we walk on. And you see our shell, the shell windows, which comes from this particular area on the Zuari River, endemic to Goa. And of course, uh, crocodiles, because I love crocodiles. <laughs> and they came out so much in so many drawings. And over here in this corner is one of, or like a cultural truce with the crocodiles, you could say, where you have this mange happen. You have like a, a puja done with the crocodiles, and then you have a truce with them. And this was a drawing in Vere. So you see, this was, I clicked this picture when the bridge was just inaugurated. I said, this is my shot. I'm never going to get this again. So you see the boats there. You see the drawing in Vere. And then, remember I told you we asked people to give us their words in Konkani? So we had their local words in Konkani that came through about their river, which, which we've documented and we will um, try to present. And this is in Opa. So the river at Opa, People still do this monstrosity of a dam. And this is where Panjim gets its water from. The water comes through from Opa. And this is in Marcel, Varun said, temple down. And over here, because there were so many people, had to attach a piece. But it worked perfectly because the river actually bends like that. So there were like, uh, there were certain cultural elements that came through of the deities being brought from Sharao to Marcel that came out in their drawing. This actually happened. Uh, two years after we made the drawing. People from the community came through and, and we had four original compositions. People danced, people presented skits, people wrote original songs, and uh, we also had, uh, we also had uh, yeah, a lot of talks around the river. This happened almost a year later. So what I'm trying to say is with this last slide and this drawing is that a river seemingly so small connects us all. And, um, you know, exploring art to create consciousness, social consciousness, is definitely something that we should experiment. It's a fun way and it's a universal language. Thank you. Give it up for me. Yeah, this uh, project is very interesting. I think a mission project or uh, it's just... A lot of people want to do that. So it's actually an open source. It's a very simple format. I can tell you exactly how to do it. And you just have to have patience. It's really, really simple. That slide uh, which showed the different uh, parts of how you create this. It just requires a little patience. And you just need to be open-minded. And you need to have your principles right on how to be open-minded and how to have a good, um, to get a good mural done. And of course, you give the people the priority. You treat the community with respect, they trust you. Absolutely. Yeah. Give it up for Ria for lovely. Thank you, Ria. Okay, guys, so this is a little uh, shout out for uh, we're always looking for. If you want to partner with Pesha uh, Kucha, like other partners, if you have a brand you want to promote or you have some extra dollars in your pocket, rupees, cryptocurrency. You can be part of Pecha Kucha. We are always looking for fun.
All right. Now moving on to Sachin. Sachin Chate. This is Sachin's uh, second time at Pajar Kuchar. Last time it was totally different. Censorship. Yeah, it was censorship, which was very interesting. At this time you've got gold cinema. Yeah. So I'll just do a little introduction of uh, Sachin. Sachin has been writing about cinema for close to 30 years now and almost 25 years with Nabhin Times as a film critic. He's a member of uh, International Association of Film Critics, yeah, for, for Chris. <laughs> and the Film uh, Critic Guild. He's also a radio jockey with All India Radio, FM Rainbow, and a cricket commentator for radio. This I didn't know. Yeah? In Konkani or uh, Marathi or in English? Great. Uh, Sachin will uh, take us through the journey of Govan Cinema. Give it up for Sachin. Good evening, thank you everybody. So, Goan Cinema, almost 72 year journey. I'll try to do it in 400 seconds. <laughs> there you go, good luck. All right, so all about Goan Cinema. Mind you, I didn't say Konkani Cinema, I said Goan Cinema because there are a few Marathi films as well that have been made in Goa. So, uh, all about Goan Cinema, starting with the journey uh, till today. So, it's very interesting that, you know, Hindi cinema became popular in Goa. Other films were being shown in Goa. But the first Konkani film only came, which was this, Mogat Auro, which came on, which released on 24th April 1950, directed by Al Jerry Briganza. And uh, on 24th April is when the Konkani Cinema Day is celebrated. Now, this film started in 49, was made in 50, and it released not just in Goa, outside Goa as well. But they had a lot of problem making this film because the government that time didn't really encourage making films. We'll come to that. Here you can see there's a premiere of the film that is happening in Rivoli. For those who are from Bombay, will know that Rivoli is a very famous theater near Matunga uh, station. So that's where the premiere happened. That's Lena Fernandez, the actress from the movie. So it had a grand opening. Now after that, what happened? 50, we made a Mughal's order. 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57. What did we do till 1962? Well, basically we didn't do anything. There was no film made between 1950 to 1962. Once again, one of the reasons the researchers say that the government did want to encourage filmmaking because a uh, lot of things can be shown through cinema, including patriotism and things like that. 63 is when Amchi Nasheep released one of the landmark films, one of the few landmark films which everybody knows. I can see all the elderly people smiling here with nostalgia when they see Amchi Nasheep here, which had that great song called Moibala Do, which uh, you know, everybody knows. Then came another film called Nirmon, the second landmark film of that time. Nirmon incidentally was also made into Hindi. It was called Takdeer. Usually we see Hindi films being made in Konkani. This was reverse. This was made by A. Salam who directed the Hindi version as well as the Konkani version. Nirmon also had many great famous songs including Shalini's uh, 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 songs and including of course the famous one Claudia. Who is this gentleman? This is a gentleman called Frank Fernand who produced these two previous films and he was a genius of sorts. That's why I mention him here. He was the producer of the film. You can see him playing the violin here because he played the violin with Kalyanji Aranji, with Shankar Jagdishan and a host of Bollywood musicians. Uh, the RK logo that you see with Raj Kapoor playing the violin, the actual violin in that Barsat song was played by Frank Fernand. What are these films? These are four films of that time, not exactly landmark films in that sense, but popular films of that era. Sukhaja Sotna, Moji Gorkarin, which was again produced by Shalini, who was an actress that time. Now here you'll see some strange names. Well, we've already gone to the next slide. Bhuyaratma Manish was 1977, the last landmark film of that time, which had music by the great, the great Chris Perry, and the title song was sung by Asha Bosle. You will not find that song even on YouTube, because you know, we don't really bother about these things. You know, ho gaya, ho gaya. So you'll find a lot of cover versions by XYZ people, but not by Asha Bosle, who sang that version. 77 to 2004, what happened? Basically nothing much happened. Again, you know, everything was thunder. There were films that were being made, not that films were not being made, but nothing noteworthy, nothing interesting, because that was also the time, you know, when DVDs, uh, VHS came in and things like that. But the next slide here, this is very interesting because it's a film that was made in Konkani, it was made in Malayalam, it was made in Hindi, it flopped in all three languages, but it had Benjamin Gilani, it had Neelam Mehra, A.K. Hangal, Aksa Sajdev, directed by Dr. Ajit Sinha, 
Uh, lyrics by Alfred Rose, music by Enoch Daniels. If you're wondering who's Enoch Daniels, he was also somebody who uh, was an arranger for many films. We come to 2004, Alicia, the game changer was the International Film Festival of India, which is known as EFI, which came in 2004. A gentleman called Rajendra Talak made these two films. Alicia was interestingly about mining in Goa. One of the first films, you know, to talk about mining, well before mining became a hot subject. Antarnath was another film, Boltot Somaris. Only two Goan films have made it to eight-year film festivals in the world. Eight-year as in Cannes, Venice, Berlin, Toronto. This one won an award for, uh, for a young director at the Toronto Film Festival, which was given by Fipreski, which I'm a member of, by the way. Uh, Poltot Somaris, Man Across the Bridge by Lakshmi Gan Chedgaupar was a big film. These two, interestingly, are big commercial successes in Kokhi cinema. Home Sweet Home, part one was a big hit. Part two tried to ape Bollywood and it was a disaster. So basically try to tell your own stories, that's the thing. Oh Maria spoke about land in Goa much before land in Goa became a big issue. So two films by Rajendra Rolak which were big. This is of course, everybody knows this because this is another landmark film. Natsuyo Kumpasar which has been what about six, seven years now still going strong. It was made at a budget of four crores but interestingly I don't know still if the producer has recovered that money. You know, all the people have been watching it for so many years and again, you know, there was no entertainment tax on this movie in the sense that they showed it at uh, Marquinez Palace. Next one, Jose, the other film that went to a B-tier international festival, it went to the Carlo Vari festival, which is again a very famous one. Les Enfants de Goa, it's the same film, but it's the only film which was released in France with a French title there. So it's the same film, Jose, again, great film about migrants in Goa. You know, we all talk about what happens with migrants, etc, etc. Two very, three other very interesting films. How to, to how is kind of like a science fiction film which was made by a very young director. Unfortunately, he's not made anything after that, but a very interesting film. Digant was about the tribals in Goa and, and the hardships that they go through you know, when moving from their land. Okay, Salpuran, we are moving very fast. This film, 99.9% .9 Goans have not probably heard of it. 99.9999 haven't seen it. Salpuran went to the Berlin Film Festival, which is amongst the top festivals. It's a Marathi film, which is produced by Sanjay Shetty of Vincent Graphics. As I said, not many have heard of this film, but hopefully we'll see it soon. Dollars. How do you make a company film? What are the, you know, uh, what is the money matter in a company film? Well, the government gives you 50% subsidy up to 50 lakhs, which means if you make a film for 40 lakhs, you'll get 20 lakhs. If you make a film for 1 crore, you'll get 50 lakhs. If you make a film for 2 crores, you still get 50 lakhs. So 50% or 50 lakhs is what you get. Uh, to future of company cinema, unfortunately, it's like the background, it's very dark. It's not a very nice thing to say, but unfortunately, that's how it is. I'll tell you why. To recover 20 lakh rupees at 200 rupees a ticket, you need 10,000 people to watch the movie. You can work out the math back afterwards. I don't have much time. So 10,000 people have to watch a movie for 20 lakh rupees to come, you ask the director of Juze and many other great films, even 10,000 Goans have not seen their films, which means they have not recovered 20 lakhs. Now, why would anybody put money in a company film? I'm sorry, I have to end on a, on a rather sad note, but what I would encourage you to do is whenever there is any good company film, please go and watch it. Thank you very much. So, you've been a, uh, is there any chance of you becoming a producer or a director? Uh, I don't I don't invest in crypto, I don't go to the casinos, I don't buy lotteries, so the chance of me becoming a producer are extremely slim. Okay. I think if you if you do become one, you'll be a good one. Right, please, of course, I would like to promote our film club also, yeah? Oh yes, yes. You talk about it. Yes, yeah, please. So uh, I run a film club at Entertainment Society of Goa, Makinis Palace, which is a heritage space. We have a proper state-of-the-art theatre with 5.1 Dolby sound, which is used for the International Film Festival of India. We show all kinds of movies there. Yesterday we showed a Beatles documentary called Beatles in India, which nobody has seen because that film is not yet released in India. We also had the director with us. Next week we are doing another wonderful film called Pedro. Pedro is not a company film, unfortunately. It's a Kannada film, which is set somewhere near the borders of Go and uh, Karnataka, one of the best films to come out of the country, which we're going to show next Thursday. As we do, every Thursday we have a screening, right, from Kurusawa to uh, Ozu to Bergman to all kinds of filmmakers, including Indian films. Thank you. So much of passion for friends. So, moving on, uh, our next speaker is Maria. Hello. 
How are you, Maria? Yeah, good. Feeling good? <laughs> yeah. We said, let's uh, let it in a little. We will go ahead with it. <laughs> yeah. We'll <laughs> make it happen. All right. I'll just do a small introduction. Maria Victor is an entrepreneur with a curious mind and a just for adventure. She is the founder of Make It Happen, an experiential travel company that designs community-led local experiences that connects traveler to local communities for a more meaningful experience. She sees heritage as a valuable economic asset that can play a substantial role in sustainable tourism development. She has been instrumental in transforming the tourism narrative in Goa and Bhim, and aspires to bring communities to the forefront of tourism in India. Seeing Goa heritage uh, with new eyes. Yeah, so over to you, Maria. Hey, give it up for Maria. <laughs> Guys, we need more energy in the room. Come on. <laughs> yeah. traditional occupations, 
try local delicacy, and experience the local way of life. So now, unlike museums, which are a planned and staged display of heritage, on our heritage walks, we give a real-time experience in the natural settings of a place. Phone with sense of smell, sound, touch, taste, and immersive storytelling. We also bring travelers right to the doorstep of local talent. For example, on our Fontaine Heritage Walk, you get to meet Chico Fonseca. Any of you met him here? Yeah. Who's a renowned woman musician who performs in Pado, Latin, as well as Konkani music. Right? So listening to his music is an experience that lingers. Now, Goa has birthed some of the world's most inspiring artists. And art can be a great way to connect with a place. So on our Panjim Art Center, we showcase the city of Panjim as one huge art gallery, where one can immerse themselves in various art forms and observe finer details that would otherwise go unnoticed. Now, food, trying local cuisine, is a multi-sensory experience that can create a profound connection with the place. So we have the Feni and Tapas Food Trail in Panjim, where we celebrate the heritage group Feni, along with delicious local delicacies as we take travelers to vintage clubs, taverns, and even contemporary establishments. Now, during the pandemic, we were experimenting with new formats of storytelling. And we produced a film called The Guardian Spirits of Goa, which is a unique recital of anecdotes and legends associated with the worship of protector spirits in Goa. Now, this is done with the backdrop of stunning audio visuals. Now, in order to fully appreciate a place, it is important to understand its socio-economic culture. And to build on this perspective for our travelers, we make sure that they interact and experience the traditional occupations of a place. So, Goa is today becoming a melting pot of diverse cultures and a creative hub for people from all walks of life. So now you can picture yourself sitting in the balcony of a renowned Goan mirror, theatrist, while appreciating Assamese crafties. Now, you know, traditional bakery, uh, artists and homegrown businesses are at the helm of creating an authentic travel experience. And we not only showcase these establishments in our in-person experiences, but we also have a shop local section in our website where travelers can pick their favorite souvenirs to take back home. Now, we are in the business of creating happiness, and we create memorable moments to cherish, like writing a postcard to your loved one, or feeling nostalgia as you listen to tales of a time gone by, or finding a friend in our storytellers, and all this means happiness for our travelers as well as local communities. So that's us, make it happen, and we are your discovery companions to discover a place, explore new stories, and create memorable new experiences. Thank you, Maria. Give it up for Maria. Thank you. Sorry, 
I keep losing things. Need my glasses. Need them. I'm looking for my report. Right, moving on. Our next speaker is the one and only Hita. Hita, go on. I'm not going to speak for you. You have to come here and speak. I don't know where I kept the remote. Hita, have you been? Yeah, a little bit looking lovely. So I just do a small introduction for you. Uh, I mean, there's a lot to say, so I'm going to just, you know, drop it down. Ita Pandit, first year job was with famed ethologist Dr. Jane Goodall on a chimpanzee research station in Tanzania, East Africa. On her return to India in 1983, Ita volunteered with Bombay Environmental Action Group and initiated several heritage preservation projects through the Indian Heritage Society, Bombay Chapter. Traumatized by the riots in 1993 in her beloved uh, Bombay, she left the city for Munar at first and then Goa, putting all her energies into the preservation of Goan houses. Nita is a Hobi Bhava Fellow and a founder member of Goa Heritage Action Group. She is currently working on stories from Goan houses and a book titled Objects and Memories from Goa. She lives in Salagao with a dog Goru and cat named Ginger. <laughs> nice names. Hita will be talking about songs sung by women at the grinding zone. And I think it's going to be very, very interesting. Over to you. Give it up for you. Thank you all for coming and thank you, Hari, for putting PPT together. My opening slide is the poster for this event. And I've got it here because whenever you talk about heritage, the first thing you think of is churches, monumental buildings, and so on, and in, in houses of Goa as well. But there's more to heritage than the monuments and the buildings, and that we call intangible cultural heritage, heritage that you cannot touch, but you can feel, and including the uh, knowledge and the property intellectual property that goes into these, uh, the intangible cultural heritage. For example, the Kunbi Sari that I'm wearing today. This is woven in Goa, it's woven and worn by the Kunbi and the Gawas, and this is also our heritage. It's not just the monuments. This, by the way, is Saraswati Ai. This is uh, uh, another storyteller that I've befriended. I've collected stories from four to seven or eight storytellers in Goa, which I'm going to speak to you about very soon. This is Lakshmi Vishnu Harvalkar in Valpoi, and uh, she composes and sings her own story. This is Subhadra Ai. She is probably the only woman in the remote Goa who knows how to repair roofs. She used to accompany her husband, who was a carpenter, and that's how she learned how to repair roofs. And people turn to her even now at 83 and ask her for advice. The lady on my right is Sarojini. She is a primary school teacher, headmistress also. And she speaks four languages, English, Hindi, Konkani, and Marathi. And she's the one who's actually also documented along with me the stories from Goan houses. This is the title of my latest book. There are about 49 stories in this book. And uh, uh, some of them are about songs of solitariness, isolation, sadness. But there are also songs of joy, wonder, and local, very earthy wisdom. Now, a lot of people think that uh, grinding uh, stories are sung around any old grinding stone, but that's not the case. This is what is uh, what we call a ragdo. The bowl is called a barn. The hammer is called a ragdo. And you don't sing when you do wet grinding. This is a fator, 
this is also not a stone where you sing songs with. The next slide you'll see is, uh, this is for both wet and dry grinding, by the way. And the next slide that you will see will be the musar. Musar, and uh, it's got a bowl, and it's got a pounding stick, a pounding staff. And this was also, this doubled up as a weapon in the old days. And this they sing with, and some of them don't have the bowl in their homes. They just have a cup in the floor of the house. Now this is the cover girl, Saraswati Ai. She was married off when she was nine years old. And why did, why did they sing when they were grinding? They sang because the grinding stone became their best friend. They could confide in a grinding stone. They could not confide in family members. Saraswati Ai said to me, when I marry a man, I marry a whole village. The village becomes my village in law. Now the songs I've collected fall into several genres. Uh, there must be more, but I haven't collected all of them. There are mother-daughter songs. There are brother and sister songs. And one of the brother-sister songs is quite harsh in which she cries in the market and the brother says, our parents have done what they could for you. I can only come for you for the Ganesh festival. I will not take you home otherwise. On the other hand, the brother sings of the sadness of not having a sister. And he compares it to sleeping under Surya Kanta tree. Surya Kanta tree is a Bahinia tree. Those among us who are gardeners will know Bahinia provides no shade whatsoever. So he compares. Well, there is also, now we talk about feminism today, but there was a time when they composed a song when Goddess Gauri was asked why she was married to this mendicant, Lord Shiva, who has no cows, no land, no wealth, nothing, goes around with a bedding bowl. And she says to her parents, she says, he treats me like an equal. That's why I love him. There are many threats to the songs disappearing. One, of course, is electricity, the coming of mixies, the change of lifestyle, and so on. But the biggest threat to these songs were the church. In 1684, they banned the singing in Konkani. And because they banned singing in Konkani, a whole genre of sing, uh, grinding songs disappeared. Now, in the village of Kepe, we've come across this small group of people, Amel Bai and her troop, in which they have preserved the songs of the Catholic Kaudas community. This is the kundi sari that they wear. And a whole change, I realize, happens when they sing. Because as compared to the solitary and isolation life of the Hindu uh, songs, here we have songs where the girl is protected. There are songs that say, oh, don't go, don't send our daughter to the tap. She's not used to tap water. She only drinks water from the spring. And in this song, the, girl, the ladies or the aunties of the village warn the boy that don't go to these jasmines, these jasmines are not for you. They, will, uh, they don't open easily. So there's a little bit of fun, a little bit of, uh, you know, earthy, very earthy advice given through the songs also. The last slide in my presentation today was the evening song. I'll just tell you a little bit about Team Sanj. It is that time of the day in Goa, which is very, very precious. It's the third part of the day. And in this song, it says, Bai Team Sana, Bai Team Sana. So she refers to the third part of the day with utmost reverence and respect and calls the third part of the day Bai, out of respect and reverence. So thank you very much. You've been very patient. Sorry, I've seen this more time. Well, let me show you. So, uh, how do you come up with these uh, ideas that you want to do research days or you want to write about this particular? Actually, I, I research architecture, as everybody knows, and the, the art of Kavi is something I've been fascinated with uh, for the last 27 years. And we were in a village called uh, Adogamar, 
for Tolambi. And we saw this beautiful Kavi art in which Garuda is rescuing a king cobra. I was with Dr. Rajendra Kerkar and his wife Purnima. And I asked her, I said, normally the king cobra and Garuda are enemies. So she said, no, in Goa, the story is that the Garuda rescues the cobra if he's drowning. In, and in Goa, when you, even if your enemy is drowning, you rescue him. So that touched a chord in my heart. And I asked her, I asked her, where are these songs documented? Are they written anywhere? And she said, nobody's documented them. So I thought, I have to collect, collect these songs and put them in. And both the books have got Kavi art illustrations. Guys, yeah. if you don't read those books, please grab them. Give it up for Hita. Okay, guys, we're just going to take a small break. And uh, yeah, and as I told you, we, we have Balas Bopu during the break. So, Satya, are you ready to take names? Great. So, if you want to promote your business, you want to tell a story, sing a song, a bitch about someone, just come here and do it for 30 seconds. And the best part is that you get 30 seconds, and if you go over, we just switch off the mic. So, we'll see you in 15 minutes. <laughs> okay guys, thanks for uh, coming back to your seats. Uh, we're moving on with our list of presentations. Hello, over there. Just, it won't take too long, okay? There's six minutes, 40 seconds into four speakers. So I think it's just another 20 minutes of silence and listening to the speakers. So our next presenter is Pedro Figueredo. <laughs> I got it right? Okay. I had to practice that. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Pedro. Born and raised in Portugal, with uh, all maternal family born in Goa. Pedro studied design in Portugal, and although he has done some works in marketing and design in Portugal, he considers having started his professional career outside of design by coming back to his maternal roots and restoring their family home and developing services within it to make it self-sustainable. Pedro will be speaking about the Figurido house, how it was, what they have done, and the importance of maintaining heritage in Goa. How many of you have heard of uh, Figurido house? Have you been there? Such an amazing place, I know. It takes a long time, you know. It's like, it used to take me that same amount of time, you know, when I... <laughs> Great. Uh, over to Pedro. Give it a big hand. So hello everyone, I'm going to speak about my house, this is the Figueredo house and to start it's a 432 year old house, it's my, as I said, maternal family's house and it's always maintained by the family, so my grandmother was here and all the forefathers are the 13th generation of the house and basically this all started with my mother wanting to come down and help my grandmother which was alone here with staff members trying to maintain a 5,000 square meter house, and this is how it looked at that time. And our purpose was to maintain it properly and constantly, build the foundation around the house, because my grandmother could not put money every year into maintaining all the house, it was very hard. So because of that, we came down and we started services. So we opened a museum, which basically showcases Indo-Portuguese and the mixes that Goa has had all around the for this 450 years of colonization. And we basically want to, of course, showcase our family history, but the mixed background, culture, cultural background that Goa has, through the trade that the Portuguese had to the colonies and everything. And we have all these spaces, so we give guided tours all throughout to showcase this, because it's very hard nowadays to maintain this house. We've been all throughout houses in Goa, and I've seen that 
you know, some of them, they are the older generations trying to maintain them, which is very complicated because they don't have the resources to do it. And to now be bringing a modern business into it, it's very complicated again, because they would have to be, like myself, almost working 18 hours, 16 hours a day some days. And so we've opened also a homestay, so that basically this part was not open for 40, 50 years, and it was looking very decayed. And so in the next slides, you'll see how it looked before some, some areas and how what we've changed as well. Now, our purpose is to create services that inspect the house. That's why we started with the museum and the homestay, which took us around, let's say, four, three, four years to mainly restore. So, as you see, a lot of the rooms were closed, had furniture inside, bottles, coconuts, Really, it really wasn't used, as I said, for 50 years. And we just turned into a sociable area using still all the things that we still had in the house. You, some things were made new. That was something we made. We had a lady made from Rajasthan, but you have still all the beds, the chairs, every single thing that we have in the house. I would say 90% of it is still everything that was acquired by the family for the past 400 years. And our purpose was because, you know, my grandmother, initially, she was thinking of giving it to others, maybe to the Taj, someone to make And we realized that there would not be anyone that would maintain the house as properly as someone with the love for it. So I was not born here, but my mother was. And she had all that knowledge. That's for her initiative to come down. Myself, I, as a designer, love any kind of history. And I had to learn everything from scratch, although I came a lot of times since I was young. And my purpose was to sh show to, the, to everyone in India, outside of what Goa really has to offer. So, as you see, even on the outside, some parts were just mountains of dirt in the back. We've made it, of course, into a more modern situation, because even in an old house, you require a very, it's a very fine line that separates the old that you want to maintain and something that you want to add to it without making it fully modern. Because even if we think about this house, this house was initially built 430 years and it was expanded to 130 years after. So some would think that, yes, may, then maybe at that time it was fully modern. So even every 50 years, years, you have something in these houses. And as you see, the house is contained of a lot of pieces. This is from a contador, so it's laid with ivory, ebony, and teak wood. It took three years to make just this piece. And there is only three pieces like this in the world. Now, once I go, of course, on our tours and we show everything that has been in the house, every different family member acquired this piece. But due to my great-grandfather, everything is, was still in the house. He joined the houses and kind of all the house and all its contents. Just my grand-aunt. From my grand-aunt, it went to my grandmother and now to us. So you have a lot of rice from Chinese pieces, Indonesian, Malaysian, Portuguese, French, English, all around. Because the traders that were existing in Goa at the time were going everywhere, bringing pieces from all around. And so we want to show the richness that Goa has to offer. Even in the Christian art, if you see the baby Jesus, which was normally given to the first, uh, the oldest lot of the house, it's actually a baby Krishna. But basically, the Hindus used to make them. They didn't know what baby Jesus looked like. So they used to make it with the face of baby Krishna as he's sucking the finger and he's got the bangles. So even in the Christian art, there's a lot of mixes, be it in the architecture, be it in the tile work, this is how you tell in hydraulic tiles, be it in every single thing. So a lot of people also see Goan houses and say, oh, I love your Portuguese house. And first thing I say, it's not a Portuguese house. It's a Goan or it's an Indo-Portuguese house because you won't find anything like this in Portugal itself. And we started doing specially crafted meals as a way on the museum itself that my mother, as you see there, is the main of the house to continue in the old recipes that have been maintained by the family and to try to provide it to as many people as we can. And also we do a lot of events from lunches, high teas, dinners, birthday parties. That is, we've even started doing some shoots I won't recommend personally. Uh, but again, trying to showcase, even in the mandos, which used to be, they used to be danced and in big parties in these halls. And we want to maintain that culture, maintain that cultural round of 
the Indo-Portuguese and what it really is. So the three generations which have made all this possible. My great-grandfather, who joined the houses and passed it to my grand-aunt, was the first lady judge and to my grandmother and now to my mother. I hope you all enjoyed and please visit. Thank you. Give it up, Pedro. Yeah, so do you still get lost in your house? No, not anymore. <laughs> but uh, what I would like to say is that I think that a lot of people also see a house like this as a big endeavor. It's a big economical endeavor, and it's very hard to put your money out. And when you look at the house and say, oh, they must have had riches behind to be able to do it. But I'll be honest that there was, of course, some savings, but we have to ask for a loan to this. And it's not a quick thing. As long as we started the work, we had guests already. Because we needed the income to keep on restoring, to keep on maintaining, to developing more of where we wanted it to be. And I think that it's hard that if the new generation kind of involves themselves in things like this, we will bring this culture of Goa back into a modern state. Awesome. Thank you for Give it up for Pedro. Thanks, Pedro. Love you. Pedro. All right, here we go. Our next presenter is uh, Sovita. Hi. I think our youngest presenter for today. <laughs> okay, give it up for Sovita. It's Kut Kutradka, right? Sorry, I'm just sometimes get surnames and names very wrong. Sovita is a performer, artist, and also loves to dabble into filmmaking. While she aims for the star, she is very much connected to her roots. Born in culturally rich Satari, she has grown up surrounded by Govan folk rituals, which many urban dwelling Govans have forgotten. She is on a mission to document and preserve these unique practices through documentaries. A journey that begins with the uh, Karavil. Can you say that? No. Yeah. Festival of her native village. Today she will be talking about her efforts so far towards promoting and preserving Goan folklore, its scout outcome, and her expectations. Over to Sobita. Could you change the mic? G A zero three eight nine five seven. Eight nine five seven. Anybody? G A 03 eight nine five seven quid. I think it's blocked for someone. Anybody? Eight nine five seven quid? Okay. So over to Sarita. Hey. Myself, Sobita, Sobita Shaba Kurtakar. Emphasis on the middle name because that's my father, because of whom I am the way I am, I am what I am. Back in 2005, when my village situated in the dense forest of Satri Taluka called Nanoda had no stage, no gatherings. He created one so that he can give children of my village a platform to showcase their talent. These are children of my village performing on various songs. And basically I was surrounded with storytellers um, like my father. And these are children of my village performing on Ranmale, a folk um, theater of Goa. And uh, he genuinely loved Goa. He wanted to contribute towards its literature, its folk, its culture. And he, he would come up with different ideas. And <laughs> that's me um, performing Pugri, a folk dance, during Ganesh Chaturthi in my village. 
I was of an assumption, with an assumption that that's how the world is. This is what happens everywhere, outside, outside my village, in Goa, other parts of Goa. But my assumption was totally <laughs> different when a drastic change happened. My father passed away and we had to shift to the city where the same pugadi had to be done for an annual gathering only with a, with a ready-made costume and a prize after the performance. For me, it was different, you know, like performing in a festival with for fun and doing it for a formal uh, gathering. So I could see my own village from afar and realize it's what it has and it's important and how beautiful it is. So I thought, how about I show what is unknown to my city friends from the stories of my village. So I came up with this documentary, a ritual of Karoli from my um, uh, Taluka, Satari, that happens during Shimba. And when it was well perceived, I got motivated to um, show more stories from my village. The other story was about Dauli Man, and um, that's my grandmother and my neighbor. They shared a memory about this instrument that they they used to play during Ganesh Chaturthi to distract themselves from hearing the sound of neighbor's Ganesh Visarjan. <laughs> so um, they play this during Ganesh Chaturthi with all the joy and enthusiasm. This is a ritual that I love. Every member, representative of every family, uh, distribute a piece of bhakri and bhaji to every each and every member of the village. Uh, with resulting in a full meal of love from all the household. I call it a ritual of union. Uh, isn't it beautiful? It's called Manso, by the way. So I thought, how about let's go a step ahead and uh, do it professionally. So I uh, applied for a project from Goa Kokani Academy and began working on Karoli ritual in a better, um, uh, in, you know, research manner. And I started working um, on research, started shooting for it. My main motto was not only show this ritual to my city friends, but also to make my people realize the importance of what they have. To realize the treasure that they have. So I began shooting and loving the process. And uh, so because of this, um, so my next subject was wedding songs um, the, to, to showcase through documentary uh, what is unique about our Goan weddings. What is uh, what makes our Goan wedding different? So because of these projects, I got to spend time with my own people, uh, listen to their stories that I don't think I would have. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, I did not know how important they were when I was in there. Uh, since I came outside, I realized how important it is. So um, we shared a lot of stories here, and when they say, "Bye, tia, tuja bapa is varia." That means in our accent that you're just like your father. And that is like a, that is something that means to me more than my likes, subscribers and shares. And that motivates me. So I thought, uh, uh, how about I share more and more stories through these documentaries using modern modes like Instagram and social media. Tanladu, bukladu, banle shelya padari. If this image had a sound, this is how it, it would have sounded. That's my mom singing a wedding folklore to my cat. That's an, that's an usual evening at my place where we sing folklore. So the idea is basically how about we practice this folk on a regular basis. Like it's a part of life, like without shying away, without embarrassing, uh, feeling embarrassed. And... Um, so to experiment with this idea, me and my sat in a city setting singing a folklore to the, uh, like, like how we jam on a modern song. <laughs> so I use my social media handle to show different faces of Goa. That's our mother in Kokani and that's my mother in Kokani. So different faces of Goa and that's a rural area, this is urban area. So, and I feel using this Instagrammable uh, modes to share can have a very good effects on, um, you know, spreading this uh, without modernizing the folklore but using modern modes, I feel. And me being a part of that generation, we like the trendy stuff, I feel. <laughs> and, and yeah, of course, the active participation is what 
and this was a very great moment for me and i had to prove that i am not a city kid you think wouldn't be able to lift that dhol so i proved myself by <laughs> playing it for 20 minutes straight and yes the trance that this moment had was inexpressible so again that's myself sobita sobita shava kutarkar then and now try slowly steadily to match my father's step to complete the dreams that he unfortunately had to discontinue with thank you फाउंडर एंड ऑन्टरप्रेनर फेनी इवेंजलिस्ट आर्किटेक्ट एंड राइटर द फाउंडर ऑफ एनी इनफ्यूज फेनी ए गोनकर बाय मैरिज हुज वाइफ कॉल्स इन अ बॉर्न अगेन गोनकर सच इज इज पैशन फॉर आर लिटिल स्टेट ए लॉर्ना फैन एंड अ फाउंडर ऑफ लॉर्ना फैन क्लब ऑन एफ पी कॉल हेलो लॉर्न आई लाइक इट बाय दाई आफ्टर रीडिंग दिस His long-cherished uh, dream of giving Fenny its rightful place in the Alcobel firmament, and now the universe is conspiring to make this happen. Fenny girl, Clement, the Silva. Today he is going to talk about my Fenny journey and my vision going toward forward for Fenny. Give it up for Clement. How many of you already have Fenny? Great drink. <laughs> See, there's so many. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 this wonderful fruit the flowers of which you see there which the portuguese brought all the way from brazil and took to various parts of the world where there, wherever there was a portuguese colony they carried it there and today the length and breadth of goa the hillsides are covered with acacia plants but it started its journey 500 years ago from brazil and in cajo season you go to the orchard morning and evening with an empty bucket you walk to the furthest corners of the plantation and you fill your bucket on the way in you only gather the fruit fallen on the ground you never pluck the fruit from the tree because when it's perfectly ready that's when it drops the sugar is perfectly in place to give you what god intended the cashew fruit for so you bring it in you separate the nut from the fruit the nut has great commercial value but the reason why god made cashew is for the pain you put the uh, fruit into the spit dug into the ground called a colony and you stomp it and there's a bar that goes across the pit which you hang on to because believe me stomping cashew is a very very slippery business or you have these two poles which you hang on to for balance traditionally it was stomped barefoot but today people use a, a pair of gumboots because your feet is quite corrosive you also have the pinjrays which have come into existence which allow you to squeeze every last drop of cashew juice out of that then that trickles down into the pits which are dug below the ground so that gravity helps you and this cashew juice is uh, it speaks to you while it ferments Three to five days, it will be sizzling and hissing, and when that stops, you know your fini, the fermentation is done, and you're ready to transfer it into these barns. This is the heart of any bhakti. This big copper pot into which you put your fermented juice, and everybody has got their own method of construction. Some people will use mud, some people will use stone, some people will use mud and stone, some people, somebody will use mangrove tile to disperse the heat. 
Everybody uses the mud from ant hills, the finest mud you can get. Imagine how fine it is. If it fits into an ant's mouth, you seal it off. And traditionally, this was how it was done. Launi fairy made, everything was done with uh, terracotta earthenware. Even the piping, even the pipes were made out of terracotta. So as the alcohol went through this, there's a certain flavor that it imparts to it, that it carries with it. The, this is the, uh, still in operation, a highly dangerous business because it's a totally closed system. You have that pot which is heated up, another pot which the uh, display condenses into. If the pressure in one gets too much, it's been known to explode and somebody says people have even died with it. Unverified but possible. Now this, uh, uh, this is another distillation apparatus. You can see the date on that, 1705, found in a monastery in Goa. An old monastery, the monks still make very good peli. There are monks at the uh, Salishans and the SVD monks in South Goa who do excellent peli. And this uh, is in Bhatti village cafe, if anybody goes there you can see it. And 1705 they had this very very advanced apparatus. Even what we follow today is the same thing. It's nothing very different. And these, I'm so proud to introduce you to my friends who follow this tradition, this, the artisanal makers of Peri, who keep this going, Katrina, Anthony, these, these guys are all over, 3,000 of them who keep this tradition alive. It's not just a product. Peri is not just a product for them. It's a whole tradition, it's a culture. It's not something to be sold, but something to be valued and pride in. These are the new guys who have done so much for Peri. In the center, the gentleman in the blue, Mr. Valentin Vaz, the founder of Big Boss Feni, Goa's first branded Feni. His sons who got the GI tag, Hansel, Regan, Gurudat. Regan Hendricks' his family has the oldest licensed distillery in all of Goa. And uh, what could I do? So I started this thing called the Feni Project. What is the Feni Project? It's an open source Google map to map the Feni makers of Goa. These small artisanal Feni makers who nobody hears about other than their village, nobody's heard of them. So anybody can uh, log on to this map, find the fairy maker closest to them, go out into the village and get your fairy. The dream is single estate fairy, single hill fairy. Go there, get your fairy. I love experimenting, so this led me to experiment with infusing fairy. A trip to Italy introduced me to limoncello. The next thing I knew, I was making something called fairy cello back home. And this went well, so the reaction was, let's go commercial. Two friends of mine, Carlyle over there, his wife Jill, joined me in this venture. They look after all the social media, then we had to look after branding. Uh, Guru made our first caps, he's a carpenter in Moira, hand turned this out of jackfruit wood. Uh, they didn't work too well because some of them leaked because the wood shrinks. So we had to scrap that and we've gone in for Chinese forks. But the feni has to be kept safe, you can't have feni leaking. And we had to learn about uh, filters and ceramic filters and cloth filters and the paper filters and uh, get our distillers to up their game from copper. A lot of them use aluminium piping. We're trying to get all of them to move to copper piping because that's the best thing to, you could use in any distillery. And uh, work with different kinds of bottles and uh, government departments. And finally, we hit the market with these three flavors, uh, limon, chili, and uh, honey cinnamon. But infusion is nothing new. Everybody's Amo had one bottle in the cupboard into which she dropped some spices and whenever you had a cold, she'd pull it out and you, uh, you know, if you were a child, they burnt the fainio so that you didn't get drunk. But it was there. But now, if you couldn't just go out into a shop and buy. That's what we sought to do. So we, we've done uh, Kaju stomping that fair. We put it into bars. One kid sent us a drawing of a bottle because her parents liked the product so much. She decided to draw it. And uh, uh, tasting, that's Varun's group, all the little short glasses, uh, pairings with, you know, the Swamis and the Sepoys and all the other people. And they always surprise us. We have a little recipe on the bottle, but they come up with something new. Somebody sped up uh, honey cinnamon peni with apple cider. Somebody slammed the oysters with chili peni. Somebody else has uh, put uh, ma mango with chili flakes and honey cinnamon, uh, uh, the chili peni and the limon peni. So this experimentation is what people love doing and Feni lends itself so well to this. It's such an accepting drink. And everybody, the Guan Dal store up all over the world, whenever they come back, there's one thing which, well, there are two things they take with them. One of course is the chorizo or goa sausages and the other is Feni. They carry that with them. So our Feni is reaching different parts of the world. You know, wherever there is a diaspora, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, uh, uh, New York, wherever. But our work is not done. When will our work be done? When that Mexican guy sitting on a beach in Mexico with his Panama hat over his head on his sunbed and the waitress will go up to him and say, Sir, 
Can I get you a tequila? And he'll say, nah, get me a penny. Give her a penny. Happy with tequila, it will happen with penny. Go for it. All right, we're moving to our last uh, presenter. Before I do that, I just want to take a selfie. So you just guy, you have to just say, "Vicha vicha," right? All right. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Victor Hugo Gomes. Hi, Victor. <laughs> so, how was the weather on the way? Because you come from a long way. Yeah? Yeah, well, you made it and people made it, so that's really wonderful. <laughs> Thanks for that. Okay, I'll just do a small introduction of Victor, who everybody knows, but we'll still do it. Founder and curator Goa Chitra Museums. How many of you have been to Goa Chitra Museum? Yeah, I think. See? Very popular with it. Okay, and he wanted his, uh, his introduction to be very, very brief. Artist, collector, conservator, music promoter, founder, and curator of Goa Chitra, Goa Chakra, and Goa Kruti Museums. Okay, and uh, Victor will talk about my journey with Goa Chitra. Over to Victor. Give it up. Yeah, I basically grew up with my grandmother who was blind. She's the one who introduced me to Goa. It's, it's not my education, no one. She was blind. She told me beautiful stories about this place that she, was, she and I was born to Goa. At that time, we kids were never allowed to go to storerooms or attics in the houses because that's the place where they used to dump all their discards. Yeah? Here, as I grew up, when I joined art college, everything was changing in Goa. My grandmother's stories were changing. Goa was changing. That's the time I decided to start something that was family-oriented, the Arun Festival, which was the biggest festival that happened in Goa those days. It was a five days festival with about 20,000, 30,000 people. After that, I realized the music scene in Goa was changing. Okay, from live music, it was becoming sequenced and programmed music. That's the time I introduced different concepts, introducing different types, different genres of music in Goa. But right from jazz fusion to Baroque music, just to get back, keep that live music alive. After that, I left frustrated. I left Goa frustrated because no one understood what I was trying to do in Goa. In Lucknow, I was one of the seven artists from all over India to get the national award from across India. During that time, I did my course in conservation. And it was Mario Miranda who brought me down to Goa to set up Asia's first Christian art museum. That's the first museum I ever saw in my life. Again, frustrated with the committee, the way they were functioning, I resigned. And I started my own journey going back to what I was good at. During that time, again, the music scene in Goa was changing. From sequence music, the live music was taken over by DJs. That's the time I decided to bring back 100% live music in Goa. I worked every musician or filmmakers that we were talking about. Okay, I worked with them, all of them. Every Goan musician. Yeah? Every year I used to do this festival, and this was what the festival was known as. Great Music Revival, where, you know, Every year, I uh, used to bring about 150 musicians down. You can see almost every, every Goan musician has come down to Goa, performed, who had never ever performed in Goa. Then here I was, doing all this, I finished all my resources. I literally became an alcoholic, I didn't know where to go. Okay, and that's the time I went back to my earlier passion, which I started with my grandmother, collecting things. I started going back, seeing everything that I was collected left in my house. 
I sold everything, all my vehicles. I was known for fancy vehicles. I bought a pickup. Before I knew, there was a rumor across Goa that Victor Hugo was finished. Finally, he's roaming in a pickup. But no one knew what I was doing. I was collecting everything that I had bought along my journey. Okay, I was collecting them and bringing them in one place. Then again, there was this new tag that I got. What's wrong with Victor? Victor's gone mad. Okay, he's jumping from one thing to another. Okay, a lot of friends gave up on me, a lot of people stayed away from me. Okay, and that's what I was known as, a madman. Again, that passion, that fire that I had never stopped. Here again, every time I earned, every time I did something, I started putting back into those objects. Every time I heard that there was an object found, I would run and check whether it's something related to Goa. Okay, that's how I collected. Sometimes. This moves slow. <laughs> yeah. You know, I had collected almost everything related to Goa, Goa ethnography. There was one thing that was missing. I was looking for 14 years for something called Garno, or original oil extractor. And after 14 years, I found one. It took me two years to restore it. And that's the birth of Goa Chitra. To restore it, I had to build a shed over it. Okay, and I only increased the size. And that's how Goa Chitra was born. Goa, I was not supposed to set up any museums. Here again, it was Chacha who worked with me for about 18 years to restore over 40,000 objects. You can see just two of us restoring objects at Goa Chitra. Every object was restored in-house. Yeah, that's my dog that follows me even today wherever I go with whatever I do. Again, whenever I found, you know, I, I had lost all friends. No one believed in me. I had few friends who would take, I didn't even have a bike that time. Okay, my friends would take me around every time I heard of an object that was found in different parts of Goa. Okay, that's how I would collect. Here again, my own family gave up on me. My father, okay, started talking to my friends. What's wrong with Victor? Why has he blocked a property, a prime property in Benauli, just a kilometer away from the beach? One lakh seventeen thousand square meters of property I blocked, okay, to give back to Goa what I had taken from Goa. That's Goa Chitra Museum. Here you can see I succeeded with everything. Okay, these are my three museums. You know, 30 years of struggle, 30 years of being called a madman. This is what I gave back to Goa. Three museums, Goa Chitra Museum, Ethnographic Museum, Goa Chakra Museum, a Transportation Museum, Goa Kruti Museum, which is about the colonial past of Goa. There again, very few. I had everything, everything, fame, everything, but except money. It was Dom Martin. Okay, artist who's based in California, who bequeathed his entire collection. So that became my responsibility to take the dream forward. Okay, so with his paintings, his house, and the little money that he had, that he donated, that's what made me. It didn't stop us here. My latest museum, which we opened last year, the Karvi Abode, which is in Betul, okay, is first of its kind concept. It's a museum tale where you experience living in a museum. Nowhere in the world there's a museum like that. It's dedicated to the fishing community and marine biodiversity. And again, it's a museum dedicated within the village, fishing village. This is my next. All my museums are like old age homes. All those objects are made of natural material. They have to some, die someday. Okay, it's, that's where I decided that I need to make replicas or miniatures. So we have already done this project of creating miniatures. We'll be able to set up many museums across Goa. Okay, that's me. Okay, it's like our life as a collector. It's like a rubber band. We can stretch it to a limit, then it snaps. It's up to your bones to take this heritage forward. Everything that's spoken today is brought to one place, intangible and he tangible heritage in one place in Benaudi. Thank you. <laughs> Give it up for Victor. I would say, what a passionate man, man. Well done. So basically, I'm trying to see the thing is really important that I think it's really important that I don't have any. So, all the things that my father had a few years ago, I thought he made it to me. Because when he died, he discovered, I found a file, and he collected all my newspaper cuttings. So, all the newspaper cuttings that he collected, and he discovered. That's why he's going to be able to do it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, before we end this night, you've been a lovely audience. Thank you so much for braving the weather and uh, being here. I just want to thank a few of our partners. Uh, we've got uh, Greater Than Jin. Is anybody around from Greater? Is anybody there? 
Yeah, they've been uh, with us from the beginning, and then we got uh, Maka and Nibir. Anybody from Maka? All right. Uh, uh, Eddie Ek, Hilton is there. There you go. Thank you for making those lovely drinks today. Well done. Give it a big hand. <laughs> and then we got Satya from Simply <laughs> Sabo. Job well done. You can have your drink now. <laughs> And uh, this beautiful venue. Uh, Dean is still around? Okay, just uh, this venue needs a big hand. Yeah. And uh, FC Goa, our title sponsor, I think nobody's here from them. And uh, all the speakers, can I have all the speakers in front just one last time, please? All the speakers. Just can you.